Welcome to episode 12 of Pain, a Firewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including top products, the latest trends, news, expert tips, and interviews with top security industry company representatives. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hello. Hey, Andrew. As we dive into a different featured topic each episode, new episodes of the podcast come out every other Wednesday, so subscribe or follow on your favorite podcasting platform to get the latest one. And feel free to leave a comment or email us at podcast at firewalls.com with feedback or questions. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into our featured topic and introduce our guest for this episode. We're now a dozen episodes into ping, and while we've mentioned the term endpoint a few times here and there, we haven't taken a deeper dive into what exactly endpoints are. In the most simplistic sense, they're the devices like computers and mobile devices connected to your network, or endpoint security, which can be a little more complicated. Just as with firewalls, network switches, and plenty of other cybersecurity solutions, options for endpoint protection are aplenty. And it pays to take your entire network setup into account to ensure you maximize your security and performance when picking an endpoint protection solution. On this episode, we welcome Sophos National Channel Sales Engineer Mike Weaver to help us paint an endpoint security picture and talk about one of the top rated endpoint protection products on the market, Intercept X. Mike, thanks very much for uh, joining us in studio for this episode. Thank you for having me. We like to start each interview with a little bit of an introduction. So tell us what you actually do with Sophos. Sure. So I'm a Sophos National Channel SE, and I'm part of the team that helps support firewalls.com. And I actually more on the technical side. So when customers need help with demos or explaining how technology works, that's where I come into play. Let's start with some basics on this endpoint security stuff. Why is it necessary? How does it complement other solutions people might have on their network? And how does it work with firewalls and other appliances? So great question. So endpoint, think of it like your home, right? In your house, do you rely just on maybe an alarm system? No, you have multiple things that you do to help protect your home. Mm-hmm. And just like with a network, you have multiple layers of security. Firewalls, everybody knows what a firewall is and everybody knows they need one. But endpoint is also just as important. Endpoint protection is a key necessity because exploits are designed to actually infiltrate and go to endpoint devices, right? Yes, they're trying to get into a network, but when they get to an endpoint, that's where they can actually get information from a computer. You know, they can find out secrets about a company. They can download things like credit card numbers. So being able to protect your endpoint devices helps protect your network. And once again, think of it just like your home. You have multiple layers of security in your home. Same thing with your network, your firewall, your email security, in this case, endpoint security. Good analogy. So what should small business owners, for example, who are in the market for endpoint security be looking for to ensure they find the best fit for them? So when you think about endpoint, it's really important to understand how endpoint works. And the major thing that we think about endpoint is how is it actually protecting that device, right? Well, that's where what we call scanning engines that comes into play. And that's very important because when endpoint protection first came out way back when, you know, 20 plus years ago, the way in which we scan for vulnerabilities, we use what we call signature-based scanning. And basically what signature-based scanning means is once a vulnerability is released out in the wild, that's called zero day. Once something's released out into the wild, in order to write a quote unquote signature, and a signature tells your scanning engine how to recognize that vulnerability and how to get rid of it, right? So, and in order to create a signature, a vendor first has to get a copy of that vulnerability create that signature, and then update their signature databases. So while it does provide protection, when a vulnerability first comes out, you are not protected because you don't have that signature, right? So on top of that, to help protect against what we call zero day, that's where we start looking at other types of scanning engines, things that help protect against what we call zero day. And that's where, if you've heard like machine learning, machine learning is very important because that helps us to look at vulnerabilities that don't necessarily have a signature for it. And think of it like the neural network of your brain and how if somebody told you, hey, if you want to identify a duck, if you see a bird floating on water, it has feathers and has a bill, that's how you recognize a duck, right? So with machine learning, machine learning, you have a base set of instructions. But what happens when that duck swims to shore and starts walking on shore? You see that it has web feet, right? So mm-hmm. you can add that as an attribute to help find that. And that's what AI does or machine learning is that it's ever adapting. And then you also have a third type of scanning engine called a behavioral based scanning engine, which, as we know, over years, we can tell or we know how vulnerabilities act, right? So we know it's going to do this or it's going to do that. So going back to that duck analogy, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, or quacks like a duck, let's treat it like a duck. So scanning engines are the most important part when we start talking about what's a good endpoint security, because we need to go beyond just signature-based scanning today. 
Yeah, you guys are definitely leading the pack in this sort of machine learning realm. I think anybody in the security industry thinks of Sophos as endpoint heavy, a big focus for you guys. You guys are currently on the Intercept X generation of endpoint. What sort of differentiates Intercept X compared to past Sophos solutions or other solutions on the market even? That's actually a great question. So when you look at Intercept X, what Intercept X adds on top of just your regular signature-based scanning is, it has four major components. It adds what we call those additional scanning engines. So it adds the machine learning, or what we call deep learning engine. And it also adds the behavioral-based scanning engine. So it adds those additional levels of scanning. The second thing it adds, it adds a feature called CryptoGuard. Everybody's heard of ransomware, right? Mm -hmm. Ransomware being the most prevalent type of vulnerability in the market today, meaning that if you get hit with ransomware, it's going to encrypt all your files, all your data, and hold your ransom to uncrypt that, right? So we have a feature called specifically CryptoGuard. CryptoGuard's sole job is the endpoint that it's on, any encryption request, CryptoGuard's going to take a look at that, and it's going to take a snapshot of that file. Mm -hmm. And while CryptoGuard's doing its job taking a stop to that file, our scanning engines are also still looking at that encryption request to say, hey, is this a valid encryption request? And what I mean by that? Well, there are valid encryption products out there, like Sophos has a product called Sophos Safeguard. It's mm -hmm. a file level and whole disk encryption product, right? It is also looking to see, well, what is it looking to encrypt? Because normal or valid encryption products are only going to be encrypting things like your data files, right? Your right. personal files. It's not going to be encrypting program files, DLL files, because if you encrypt your program files, how are you going to use that program, right. right? So if the engines determine, hey, this is a bad process, it's going to kill that process. And then it tells CryptoGuard, hey, anything you just encrypted using this process, roll those files back. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'll be the first to admit we're not the only people in the industry that can stop ransomware. However, the question is, is or the thing you should look at whenever you're evaluating an endpoint vendor, especially when you're talking about ransomware, is ask the question, what does it take to become whole again? Meaning that once that ransomware attack has happened, you've cleaned it up, you might have some files that have been encrypted. How do you now get them back to the way they were? So you either have to pull out backup systems mm -hmm. or you might rely on Windows Shadow Copy, which then means it's only protection for Windows products. But what CryptoGuard does, because it took that snapshot just before that encryption, we automatically roll that back for you. You don't have to do anything. So CryptoGuard is another cool feature of IntercepTX. The third thing that we do is once we have seen some sort of vulnerability, something had happened, we have a very powerful engine called our Sophos Clean, which then cleans all that up. But the fourth component that really adds for IntercepTX, which is to me the best thing, is we have what we call our Threat Analysis Center. And what that does is, is once we've seen something, we've cleaned it up, we create this really nice report for you that gives you the forensics of the entire attack chain. What I mean by attack chain. So once a vulnerability started and it did everything it was doing all the way till it stopped doing whatever it's doing, that's called the attack chain. And that threat analysis gives you not only everything that it touched, but it gives you a nice graphical view of everything that happened along the way and everything that happened with that attack chain. We were actually able uh, a little earlier today to see the threat analysis and these maps you were talking about. And yeah, there's arrows pointing exactly what happened. You could click on the different parts in the map and get more details and information. So it looked like a very intuitive system. And the best thing there is it shows you exactly what happened. And let's say that it's part of maybe some compliancy that you have to divulge that, you know, you, you got breached, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the reality is in this industry, it's not a matter of of if you did, but when, right? But if you have to divulge that, the nice thing about a threat case is you can actually just show them their threat case and it shows everything that happened, everything that was done and everything you did to make sure that that's not in your network anymore. And I think we can get a sample of this, a good look at what that system looks like and have description links for it. Absolutely. And just following up a little bit on the ransomware question in particular, because we've talked about in the news every week, there's a couple of places that suffer ransomware attacks. And so just to underline the encryption situation. So basically ransomware will come in and encrypt all of the files on your computer. So if you have this crypto guard system, for instance, in place, then it's keeping that copy of the files. And one of the toughest pieces that anyone has to deal with with ransomware is getting them back getting them back. And it's another thing just real quickly to point out there, what's really key about CryptoGuard is, is just to make sure we're all on the same page here. You know, so far we're not a backup company. We're not backing up the whole entire hard drive. Mm. We're only backing up those files that are being requested because that backup is taking place right on that hard drive. So that usually a question I get is, oh, well, am I going to run a hard drive space? No, because this stuff happens in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. And we're talking the encryption part, us detecting it, stopping it, fixing it. So, you know, we don't really back up that many files. Mm. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. And we only back up the files are being requested to be encrypted. Okay. There's been a lot of information in the industry about EDR and MDR as of late. So what is EDR, for instance, and MDR? And how do the new capabilities integrate with Intercept X, for instance, compared to previous endpoint products? 
So first off, let me just define what EDR and MDR is. So EDR stands for endpoint detection response, and MDR stands for managed detection and response. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the Intercept X product from Sophos, we really kind of have three levels of Intercept X. We have Intercept X Advanced, which is just the endpoint product itself. Then we have what we call Intercept X Advanced with EDR. What EDR adds to the capabilities is when you think of endpoint detection or endpoint products, endpoint products are typically reactive. Right. So think about it. Endpoint products are designed that once something gets on your device, it's supposed to do something right. It's supposed to help protect your device. So it's mostly reactive. But what EDR allows you to do is now allows you to be more proactive. And what I mean by that is so let's say that, you know, on my computer, I was surfing somewhere. I clicked on a link inside of a Web page and took me to some website that was known to be bad. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't mean to do that, but somehow a hacker compromised a website and it took me to a bad website, right? right? It was trying to do its bad thing. Our Intercept X Advanced saw that, stopped it, did whatever it needed to do to fix it, right? So now I have a, an alert in my console. And let's say as part of that vulnerability or that website that I went to, there's now an IP address associated with that website, right? And I can see that in our threat analysis case we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So with that IP address, I can now take and put that into my Sophos Central console and I can now search all of my endpoints that I'm managing to see if anybody else had went out to that website because maybe they might have something now on their computer that's lying dormant because sometimes vulnerabilities lie dormant on that device to help keep from being detected. Right. So now I can proactively go out and now search that. And then the third level we have on that is called our Intercept X Advanced with EDR and what we call MTR. So first of all, MDR is Managed Detection Response. And that's actually the name of the industry space. For Sophos, our product in that space is called MTR, which stands for Managed Threat Response. And that's actually a service that somebody's constantly monitoring your network to look for any other types of vulnerabilities that maybe an endpoint on its own doesn't catch, but the human eye does. And all three of those different levels of our Intercept X product are all available through firewalls.com. We mentioned earlier that machine learning and artificial intelligence are definitely making an appearance in the cybersecurity world. How do they factor into Intercept X and the Sophos offering specifically? So good question. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, everybody mentions artificial intelligence or in this industry for endpoint protection, you hear the term machine learning a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So what really makes somebody different from somebody else? Well, for Sophos, we actually call our machine learning engine, we actually call it a deep learning engine. The reason why we do that is because the way in which it was fabricated was totally different. And just to give you a background on where our engine came from, Back in 2010, the government initiated a project called the DARPA project. Mm -hmm. The DARPA project was designed to help look at an attack chain from start to finish, kind of like we talked about just a few minutes ago. So looking at an attack oh, chain God. from start to finish, as part of doing that, there was a company called Invincia that helped the government create this engine to be able to do that, right? And as part of that, Sophos acquired Invincia about four or five years ago. And because of the way in which it works, it is radically different. It is a multidimensional using like the neo network of your brain, mm -hmm. right? And when we look at something like that, you know, when somebody says, you know, well, what really makes your engine better than, than somebody else's, right? You know, every person, every vendor that you talk to is always going to tell, you know, that their product's the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? One of the things I like to do when somebody asks me that question, you know, why Sophos over somebody else? Look at the third party reviews. Like nowadays, there's reviews for everything. So when you want to buy something for yourself, right? So when you look at third party reviews from companies like NSS Labs that does testing, AB test, SC Labs, Efatos, all those companies actually do third party testing to let people know how well a product works. Mm -hmm. One thing you'll always see with our Intercept X product is that we always have the highest amount of catch rates and the lowest amount of false positives. And that's all because of directly our deep learning engine. You touched on the false positives and I think people might be able to put together why that's bad, but explain a little bit about why having too many false positives would be bad for somebody. Sure. So false positives, first let's define what a false positive, right? Yeah. So false positive is marking something bad that's really good, mm -hmm. right? So when we look at endpoint products, endpoint products are based on the way they were designed. They have to analyze something and make a decision, right? When I say they, it is artificial intelligence, right? right? So it's making decision, but when you have an engine that couples in all of the data analysis that Sophos has collected over the past 25 years and put that as a data set inside of our machine learning engine, it actually makes a more powerful, more best engine. And that's why we're able to do a better job of, you know, not having a high rate of false positives because we have a better data set to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it sort of uh, saves the network admin a lot of time uh, looking at potential, Absolutely. Yeah, potential things that could be wrong but have not. Um, speaking of the admins, we touched on the threat response and analysis piece of Intercept X a little earlier, talking about how you can get the root cause analysis of an attack. What kind of info could an admin expect out of this system? So once again, so when we find something, right, mm -hmm. we have all those things to kick in, like our crypto guard, our sofa's clean. But the reality is, or the key thing is, is once all that happens, being able to see what happened from start to finish, so our threat analysis center, those threat cases that we create, the root cause analysis is what we used to call that. We changed mm -hmm. the name of that. So it's now called threat analysis center. And those threat cases that it creates, the forensics that you see going from start to finish, that's really what's really powerful about our product because now you know explicitly what happened along the way. Mm -hmm. So in the past, you know, when someone says endpoint, you think computer on, on your network for the most part, but now mobile devices are such a big part of the equation for any business. How does Intercept X incorporate mobile security as well? So with our introduction, we recently came out with Intercept X for mobile products. We've always had done a, a great job with a lot of endpoint products, but the mobile side, we've always had like an endpoint product. But remember, as part of Intercept X, that gave you those additional scanning engines. So remember, we talked about signature-based scanning mm -hmm. versus doing the machine learning and behavioral-based. Well, adding that Intercept X, adding those additional scanning engines to a mobile product now gives you that same level of protection that you had on a Windows or a Mac workstation. You now have that same level of protection on your mobile devices. We were talking a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, having something installed on your endpoint when someone's not part of your network, for instance is a big deal. And, you know, plenty of people have business mobile devices, business laptops, mm -hmm. things like that. So how important is that to have that protection? Well, it's very important because when you have people using mobile devices, when they leave your network, right? So firewall is designed to help protect your network when I'm sitting behind your firewall. But as soon as I leave your network, how do I protect and make sure that that endpoint device, so like my corporate issue laptop, how do I make sure that's still, that's still protected? Well, because the agent or the endpoint product actually resides on that endpoint device, on that mobile device, whether it be a cell phone, a tablet, or a workstation, right? Because it's not just, when we talk about mobile, it's not just cell phones anymore. Right. It's anything somebody can carry. Anything mm -hmm. that runs an Apple iOS operating system or Mac or Windows or an Android, right? So anything like that, because that now resides on that endpoint device, I can still control that device like I would if, quote unquote, if they were sitting behind the firewall. Example, in a firewall environment, a lot of times firewalls help protect against which websites they can view and which applications they can use, right? Mm -hmm. Well, once they leave your network environment, unless you have something on that device, how do you protect that device or keep them from surfing things like maybe pornography or gambling websites when they're not sitting behind your firewall? Well, because this is all part of the agent, it resides on that device. So no matter where they're at, whether they're you know, in a hotel room or working from home, we're still able to enforce those same policies as if they were sitting in your network behind the firewall. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with mobile devices and IoT and all these different new classes of traffic joining networks, um, big thing coming into play is ease of management. So how exactly easy or difficult or you know, how much time goes into managing endpoints with IntercepteX? So using our products, so first off, our IntercepteX Advanced product is managed through our Sofa Central platform. The reason we call it a platform is because there's several things we can do in that platform. It's not just managing endpoints. We can do server products. We can do the mobile manage like we mentioned before, email security, quite a few other things we can do there, right? But the Sofa Central platform, what's nice about it is once you set up like your users that are going to be in there and you can do things like Active Directory Sync, so I don't have to copy each person individually. But the platform itself is a cloud-based platform that's easy to use. I can access it anywhere in the world. And basically, really, it's like I just decide what kind of policies I want to create. And the nice thing about our product is it's not a one size fits all. You don't have to create. It's not one policy and it's assigned to everybody. You can create policies based off of individual users, organizational groups or the devices themselves. Another piece of this puzzle is people have their own solutions already, potentially, whether it be a firewall of various brands. I know Sophos obviously mm -hmm. has XG Firewall and offerings there. And also they might have their own antivirus endpoint type platform. So, so how does Intercept X work with people who might be in those types of situations? So Intercept X is designed that if somebody already has a product, 
right? And they're using what we call the traditional signature-based scanning. And maybe they've already, let's say, bought it, let's say, like maybe like a three-year contract and they're halfway through it. So they don't want to just ditch that and start with something new. Intercept X can, because those different types of scanning engines we talked about earlier being machine learning and behavioral-based, because those are different types of scanning engines, they can run right alongside anybody else's endpoint product, right? Mm -hmm. And we also talk about other network products or more specifically talking about how does endpoint work with a firewall. For the most part, you don't really see firewalls and endpoint working together because when we look at the endpoint or we look at the security space, I should say, the security space is taught you to think of it as two different silos. You have your endpoint silo that handles all your endpoint, and then you have what we call your network protection, things like your email security, your firewalls and stuff like that. And why is that? Because when you look at most vendors that operate in those spaces, they only operate in one or the other. Mm -hmm. Sophos is really unique in that we actually have a true endpoint product and network protection product. So email security, firewalls, and stuff like that. So typically firewalls and endpoint don't really talk to each other. But in this case for Sophos, because we actually make an endpoint product and a firewall product, we've actually written code into both of those to actually truly talk to each other. Now, why is that important? The reason why that's really important is because now it gives you tighter security integration. The reason for that is our firewall is interconnected with that endpoint. If the endpoint is showing that it's in a compromised state, it actually communicates that to the firewall. Mm. That typically doesn't happen. So what that means is now the firewall acts upon the health and status of that device. If it's showing that it's in a compromised state, our firewalls, so if you're using our endpoint, our Intercept X products with our XG firewalls, the XG firewall now has the ability to you know, isolate that device on the network so it can't go to other network resources and you know get to your SharePoint server and, and infect that now. Mm -hmm. But it also protects it from other devices sitting on that same network, so other workstations on the same network, right? So it does that. Plus, it also allows you to do some other things like being able to, if there's an application that somebody's using and the firewall doesn't recognize, it, the firewall can now ping that endpoint and say, hey, this application you're using, I don't recognize it. How do you recognize that? And how do you see it? So basically think of like giving like an application signature on the fly. So now the firewall, you can now create policies for that. So when you look at typically, once again, endpoint in conjunction with other things like firewalls, typically that's not something that happens, but it's unique with Sophos because we do make both. They do truly talk to each other. And this is what you guys talk about when you speak of synchronized security. Exactly. That's what we call it, synchronized security. All right. The security heartbeat too, right? I believe uh, that's yep. The, uh, security that's heartbeat. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, when it communicates that synchronized security heartbeat and that what we call cross communication mm -hmm. um, from the endpoint to the firewall, that's how you're able to get that tight integration and get those extra added benefits. Mike, thanks Appreciate very much for coming in. in, physically coming in, joining us in the studio <laughs> space. It's always nice. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. It's time for headlines. In this regular segment, we discuss a few top news stories in the network security world and what they may mean to you. Let's go to headline number one. NFL Twitter accounts hacked, including those of Super Bowl bound Chiefs and 49ers. So as you may have noticed, Sunday was the Super Bowl, and we typically refer to the week leading up to it as Super Bowl week. That's a creative name I came up with <laughs> just on the fly. It got off to an unusual start, though, with about half of the NFL's official team and along with the league's Twitter accounts getting hacked. A Saudi hacker group called Armine, that's O-U-R-M-I-N-E, claimed responsibility for the coordinated attack that started on Pro Bowl day of all days is nothing sacred mm -hmm. and continued to the next the, day. Right. So this was a pretty ballsy marketing campaign on behalf of <laughs> our mind, it turns out. We're a quote unquote white hat hacker group. This is basically a security company that is hacking Twitter accounts as a way to show that Twitter accounts are hackable in the hopes that you will hire them to make your Twitter account less hackable. Which to me suggests that maybe calling yourselves white hat is not the appropriate definition for this particular group. But gray at best. Yeah, definitely shades of gray there. Technically, white hat hackers are considered ethical hackers who hack to test organizational security in good faith. And here's the key term, with permission. Yeah, I would say the NFL was a bit on the not cool side of this one. <laughs> The first team that had their account successfully hacked was the Chicago Bears. This is on Sunday the 26th. Unusual failing for a Bears defense that usually shows up on Sundays. But <laughs> they were the first, followed by several others, and eventually the league's account as well. Yeah, so one of the tweets from the Bears account said, Just kidding. Hi, we are mine. We are here for two things. Announced that we are back. 
show people that everything is hackable. To improve your account security, then they give an email address. And then for security services, they give their website. And then they want you to follow their Twitter handle as well. On a different tweet from the Chief's Twitter, they also asked you, let's get hashtag our mind back trending on Twitter. We all were missing our mind. Uh, for what is worth, the our mind did choose the Chiefs as their Super Bowl pick. Yes, they did. And maybe that was because they didn't get a chance to actually post a tweet from the 49ers <laughs> account, even though they right. did start to hack it. So yeah, a very interesting, unusual story. The Armine folks said that they stopped work in 2017 due to, quote, uh, some issues. But uh, Quite vague. But as the tweet said... They, they have now returned, back. yes. <laughs> we were all waiting with bated breath. Right. I guess you would call it a different form of guerrilla marketing, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, guerrilla warfare marketing. <laughs> Insurgent marketing. <laughs> I'd be curious to find out in a, some sort of follow-up story to see if they actually got a bunch of business out of this. But uh, I'm uh, not sure what a company can do to have their Twitter account less hackable other than maybe a two-factor off to sign in, but uh, it seems like that'd be more on Twitter's. <laughs> Uh, docket than the companies they're hoping to get to hire them. Yeah, definitely. It's just an odd situation because, uh, I mean, going back to the white hat, gray hat, black hat debate from hackers, obviously this wasn't the worst possible thing you could do if you hack these very popular Twitter accounts. They didn't post any offensive images or language or anything like that. There was no malware involved being distributed in, in any way, at least so far that we're aware of. But still, not purely pure motives here. <laughs> Well, we're going to do a little experiment ourselves, so you should wake up Wednesday morning with this podcast already downloaded to your phone. So, <laughs> And if you happen to be listening, then it, I guess it worked. It sure did. Now for headline number two. And this is a two-parter. And while the subjects seem unrelated on the surface, they point to a broader issue of hackers taking advantage of highly searched popular terms, issues, people, etc., to successfully plant malware. So the first part of this two-parter is involving the coronavirus. So obviously it's a major public health issue that has people around the world rightfully worried, but some hackers are using this concern to trick people into clicking on malicious files. Right. So I'm basically sending out emails, most of these in the Japanese language. Subject lines include the day's date, uh, the Japanese word for notification, other sort of buzzwords like that that's going to make it appear pretty official. And uh, these emails are advertised as being full of tips and tricks to prevent the outbreak from infecting you. So it seems like pertinent information at a urgent time. So it's a, it seems like a pretty good trap they've set here. Yeah, definitely. They are also, the emails apparently come from a disability welfare service provider in Japan, and they chose Japanese as the language and Japan as maybe the first target country here because of its proximity to China. A lot of people traveled between Japan and China and a lot of anxiety in that part of the world right now, I'm assuming. Definitely. The IBM X-Force were the people who found this particular thread of malicious emails. X-Force is a great name, by the way. Yes. A plus. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are also other versions of the email as well, which include an official looking footer with contact info for local health authorities. So they've done their homework on this. Typically, the emails that you see asking for clicking Some on money, those attachments yeah. or yeah, the invoices or payment notification things that I think everybody's seen a few of those in their day. But these particular emails that that IBM X Force was spotlighting have a familiar friend in the attachments. Uh, yes, that would be Emotet, which uh, we've spoken uh, about a couple times here. And this is a very popular form of malware to sort of pair up with other attacks. So whether that be social engineering or tied into ransomware in some way, uh, Emotet's very popular in 2019, 2020. So it's a no surprise to see it here. Japan is usually focused more on the corporate email scams. So mm -hmm. stuff like payment invoices, you mentioned, st things like that. So this is a, a bit of a departure from form for them. Yeah, so the attachments are often Office 365 files, at least the Emotet ones, they ask the user to enable content to get mm -hmm. past the protected view. So you actually get a pop-up message for that. Then if you do enable the content, in comes Emotet. So definitely have to be careful of those. And 
those aren't the only emails that have to do with the coronavirus. Kaspersky also found emails with other attachments, also using coronavirus theming with like MP4 video attachments, PDFs, and other doc files, implying that they have instructions on protecting yourself from the virus or breaking threat updates, virus detection procedures, etc., And so those files contain a variety of Trojans and worms that destroy, modify, copy, or block data. So a lot there. And of course, X-Force folks are warning that even though right now we're talking about Japan being targeted, as we see the coronavirus issue becoming a worldwide issue, certainly would expect to see it in Europe. Don't want this uh, virus to go airborne on us. (laughs) Yeah. So as the potential of the outbreak grows, certainly the potential of people to be uh, curious about an email like this grows mm-hmm. as well. So, And it's hitting right on those fear, urgency, doubt, you know, impulses that people have. So uh, I don't want to be impressed by the attackers, but, you know, they, they've done a good job for what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, they're doing their homework and it's the kind of thing that people might not think quickly about, you know, take that extra beat to really fully digest whether the email is dangerous for them and they'll just be more concerned with the real life danger outside of the email that it would be addressing. So uh, what else do we have here that's pushing malware these days other than the coronavirus? Yeah, so the other part of this two-parter is a little bit different type of situation. The Grammys were just uh, a couple of weeks ago and Billie Eilish had a very good day. But Taylor Swift leads with the most malware files. So this is also Kaspersky put together a list of 14 Grammy nominated artists and found a 39 percent jump from 2018 to 19 in attempts to download or execute malicious files disguised as their music. In fact, they found about 31,000 of those files. Yeah, this surprised me a little bit. The article does go on to mention that these researchers believe that as streaming becomes more and more popular and actually downloading music and actual files becomes less popular, that these kind of drive-by download type attacks will shrink. I I kind of assume that'd be a much smaller problem already with how quickly streaming's grown. Yeah, there's no more Napster out there, so I I thought people had passed downloading. Yeah, I thought we were all better than that at this point. (laughs) But I guess people want to have the file at will uh, to play. And so rather than buying an album or paying for a streaming service that lets you download the files officially, I'm sure there are still people out there who do go through unofficial channels. And so uh, it seems they receive some sort of email or download link telling them that this is where a certain popular song by one of these artists will live and they can go download it. But obviously instead you get the malware instead. And so this is actually a pretty good measure of the popularity of songs and artists based on the popularity of the malware associated (laughs) with them. Nothing more pure than the greed. (laughs) Yeah, so Billie Eilish, for instance, as we said, she had a very good day at the Grammys winning pretty much everything. She saw the biggest year-over-year increase from 18 to 19. She was associated with 221 of those malware files in 2018. And how many of those were bad guys? (laughs) Probably none in 18, but in 19, (laughs) 1,556. So a big time jump in percentage of Billie Eilish malware. We mentioned Taylor Swift was number one, Ariana Grande number two, and Post Malone were the top three artists whose music was most commonly used with malicious files last year. And between the three of them, they had more than half of all of those 31,000. You know, that's a, like you said, that's a good stat for popularity. You know, those three might even be happy with the, the, (laughs) with those results. Yeah, it's it's just another measure. In fact, one bad sign, I guess, for Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande was they actually went down a little bit from 18 to 19, even though they were still number one and two. So their market share is getting uh, cut into a little bit. They're going to have to put out a new album sooner. They're going to lose the, uh, the hacker demographic. <laughs> So the top malware-related songs were Sunflower, which was a Post Malone song, Talk, which was a DJ Khaled song, and Old Town Road, which you may have heard a few times last year, too, yeah. from Lil Nas X. So basically, three of the most popular songs were the top malware-related songs, and three of the most popular artists were the top malware-related artists so uh, easy little trick to help prevent this rather than downloading any links just go to youtube and type in the name of the song that should bring it right <laughs> up for you 
Yeah, plenty of options out there to listen to this music whenever you want without putting yourself in danger. Let's jump to headline number three. The Department of Interior grounds its drones amid cybersecurity concerns. It's non-emergency fleet of drones, that is. And the reason the DOA, the DOI rather, says the move will help ensure the technology used for these operations is such that it will not compromise our national security interests. So what are their concerns? Well, just to clarify, this is talking about flying mechanical drones and not just government workers. Um, So (laughs) these are non-emergency drones. The emergency drones we're not grounded, luckily. Uh, these are used for things such as search and rescue, aiding with natural disasters. The article did not specifically go into the different job functions of non-emergency drones, but I know as well as the Department of the Interior, the U.S. military has also banned drones for similar reasons. So I mean, this might be something you see unfolding across multiple government agencies very soon. Yeah, so this particular announcement makes official something that they had already been doing. And the order announcing the temporary grounding says information collected during drone missions has the potential to be valuable to foreign entities, organizations, and governments. So they're concerned about possibility of a live streaming video, images, flight records, etc. to unsecured servers. And they don't mention a specific country in the announcement, but there is a particular culprit that most people are connecting this to. Yeah, um, this goes in line with a lot of similar decisions in the government that Chinese companies are facing a lot of bans and sanctions preventing them from winning U.S. government contracts uh, over concerns with their connection to the Chinese government. The idea being that at any time the Chinese government could approach these companies and basically force them to share data that they've collected overseas. Yeah, we just talked about TikTok in our previous episode, and you mentioned in passing Huawei. Mm -hmm. Those are both facing certain types of bans in government circles in the U.S. as well. So these drones, the vast majority of them are either made in China or contain several Chinese made components. So that's where the concern lies. As you mentioned, other agencies have already banned these drones as well. And the Trump administration recently signed off on a ban for the U.S. military to purchase Chinese made drones in the future in the National Defense Authorization Act. So, yeah, this is just kind of the beginning of, sure. of the situation. So the Department of the Interior had about 800 of these drones, 665 of which were built in China. The others were built by a company named DJI, which uh, Apparently still sourced some of their parts from China. So those affected were pulled as well. And DJI plans to start building all of their drones in California in the future to sort of sidestep this problem. Right. The Idaho National Laboratory apparently recommended back in October that supply chain verification and high level software, firmware and hardware reverse engineering take place on these drones. And so I don't know if they've actually found a particular issue as of yet. There hasn't really been any information about that. It's more just uh, the general fears and, of course, you know, the possibility. It, yeah, the possibility. And drones are IoT devices <laughs> as well. So, yeah, and this touches on sort of an issue that's common in IoT is this the supply chain idea, as you mentioned, where you really have to stay on top of it, uh, even if you're constructing an entire product in America and it's all American made. Supposedly, you could have several parts that were at some point went through China for a part of the production process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't know what level of security these drones came equipped with and what the government agencies have been doing to further that security. But it all comes together in a a package that you have to worry about. And officials, they did not name China partially because they are leaving open the possibility that other foreign made sources could have issues as well. So just a general concern about security. You don't want to have sensitive information transmitted. I'm not really sure what these drones are doing on a non-emergency basis. It could be surveys of locations that maybe they want to keep secret. imagery. Yeah, certainly plenty of possibilities. And of course, you know, if there's a vulnerability in just about anything that's connected to something else, then that could be a way into doing a lot of other things non-drone related as well. So certainly things to think about there. At firewalls.com, we're fortunate enough to have a team of certified network engineers who offer a variety of services for top security brands like firewall configurations, 
endpoint deployment spoken about in this episode and expert support to name a few in our engineers minute one of our experts takes a moment each episode to provide a tip or answer a question that's where you come in leave a question in the comments or email us at podcast at firewalls.com and you just may get your question answered in a future episode we talked earlier about endpoints and Sophos endpoint security in particular, and our engineer Nick is stopping by to give you a tip or three to help you get yours set up. And I've got a big tip for bringing security into your network with three easy steps using Sophos Endpoint. When you sign up for Sophos Endpoint, you'll be sent an email to set up your account. That's step one. Finish setting up your account as well as inputting your users. And from there, we can move on to step two. Select your users and then click the email setup link option to send them the installer link. Finally, install the software from the link and you're protected. It's as easy as one, two, three. By default, Sophos Endpoint is configured with best practices in mind, so you know you'll be protected from the get-go. Still have questions on Sophos Endpoint's deployment process? We have a full team of certified network security engineers ready to assist however we can. To learn more about what our network engineers can do for your business, give us a call at 866-403-5305 or go to firewalls.com slash services. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast. And thanks again to Mike Weaver with Sophos for discussing endpoint security and Sophos Intercept X with us. Check out the links in the description to learn more, as well as our blog, Firewalls.com slash blog. Subscribe or follow now to ensure you get the latest episodes as soon as they're available. And please do rate and review us wherever you listen to the podcast. Visit firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode. But in the meantime, we remind you to get get secure, secure, stay stay secure. secure.